May all beings be happy. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will which harm upon another, even as the mother protects with her life the child, the holy child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, upwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain its recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding, by not holding to false views. The pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being free from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. How's the sound? Is that okay? Excellent. I have been telling Ajahn Brahm to lose weight for a while, so I don't know. And I also suggested once that if he did have a sex change and became a bikini, yeah. then he'd really understand how it is for bikinis. So maybe this is Ajahn Brahm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds similar. Anyway. <laughs> Definitely lost weight. <laughs> That's very cheeky, so I hope he's not tuning in from Singapore. Anyway, actually, before I start, I got a very good tip from one of my bikini friends. She's called Aya Ananda Bodhi. She probably doesn't know that it stuck with me, but um, she said when she's giving a Dhamma talk in a new place or to a new group of people, she always introduces herself because somehow it's a little bit rude not to. And I thought about that and I thought, yeah, we shouldn't make presumptions, right? That you all know who I am or what I'm about and you actually feel safe to put your questions to me for one thing, right? <laughs> so just as a courtesy for those who maybe don't know me very well, I'll just say a few things. It's a story, right? Because really it depends on our mood, how we kind of frame our lives and ourselves and, you know, which parts we tell, which parts we conceal. But in brief, uh, I was born in England almost 50 years ago, which is half a century, I realized today. And I always joke that I was waiting. Maybe it's true. I was kind of waiting for Ajahn Brahm to be a monk. And then I was born. Because <laughs> he's going to be 50 as a monk this year. So anyway, I'm keeping up with him. So um, yeah, I had a kind of a uneventful childhood, pretty... Uh, privileged in many ways, quite peaceful, stable family, did well at school, beautiful best friend that I grew up with, which is a real blessing. I think that's incredibly rare in the world. And she's still my best friend. She's on our board of trustees, actually, for Anna Kamper. Um, and yet, when I was a teenager, I suddenly hit this sort of sense of despair 
and a kind of existential despair that really wanted to know why I'm here and what I'm doing. And it was kind of, um, it was urgent somehow because I could feel myself being compelled, you know, to go along the usual route of doing well at school, going to uni, getting into some kind of relationship and job and house. And I just thought, hang on a minute, why? <laughs> Do I even know myself? Do I even know what I want to be doing in my life? And it was a real burning question for me that uh, two or three years later actually led me to India with that same best friend. And we traveled to India, not knowing anything about what we were to expect or you know, the kind of culture shock that we would experience, but just with a sense of wanting to understand something different from the values we've been brought up with. And it was a kind of spiritual search. And I always feel so fortunate that it was India we chose, because neither of us really knew why or, you know, quite what we would learn there. Um, and it was a big culture shock in the beginning, but a, about a year later, after traveling and seeing beautiful places, Himalayan mountains, full moon parties, <laughs> you know, experiencing whatever I could experience, it was almost as though I wanted to tick it off my list, you know, done that, that didn't work, done that, that didn't work. And finally, I thought, okay, what is going to work? I just don't know really where happiness lies. And I heard about these meditation retreats where you're basically kind of in a prison, much more strict than this retreat. And there's no escape from your mind or from your body. You know, you basically have to sit for at least 12 hours a day <laughs> to the bell. So you sit down, when the bell goes, you go into the hall, sit down, and you stay there until the bell rings. Five minutes break, come back sit again, another hour, the bell rings, five minutes break. <laughs> and this goes on for 10 days with no reading, no writing, no chit chat. And when I read that schedule, I thought, yes, this is what I want to do. I don't want any escape. I just want to see what's going on inside and figure out what this mind will do. Like, will it find its own way out of suffering? Or will it somehow dig itself into a hole? And at this point, I wasn't a Buddhist. I didn't know anything about the Buddha's teachings, particularly, um, other than an instinct, I guess, that compassion and kindness had to be one of the solutions to the suffering in the world. But I didn't really understand how suffering arose or that there was an escape, right? So I was more interested in the practice from a psychological perspective. But then when I did uh, meditate on that retreat and actually see, you know, the workings of my own mind and the way it was relating to the body and the way that, you know, certain thought processes did lead to a lot of suffering and a sort of contracted mind, whereas other kind of attitudes or skillful ways of regarding phenomena led to more freedom, more release, more softness in the mind. And this was really fascinating for me, and it changed my life completely. I realized in that retreat that I wanted to give the rest of my life to the practice, which was very fortunate. I was only 20 at the time. And uh, yeah, I didn't have a return ticket back to my country. So in a sense, I could, you know, create my own future, which we all can, but of course it's much easier if you don't have a job to go back to and family, etc. And I spent the next seven or eight years basically developing the practice and also giving a lot of Dhamma service, mostly in India and Nepal. And the aspiration to uh, renounce became increasingly strong, naturally, as a result of that practice. It wasn't something that I felt I should do necessarily. My teachers were mostly lay people, but um, I just started to lose the interest in the world outside because I was finding so much contentment and a uh, sense of balance and meaning inside. And so this gradually led me up to ordaining in Myanmar when I got the opportunity. It was 10 years until I did find 
a suitable place because there just aren't many places for women to actually take the robes and have conducive conditions to meditate, to practice. Um, and so when I finally found the opportunity, I literally just leapt at the chance. And I ordained in Myanmar, first time in 2004. By now I was studying Indian medicine <laughs> because I hadn't found a monastery. And I thought, I'll start this uh, Indian medicine thing as a backup. And as it happens, you know, after one year of studies, the monastery kind of, someone told me about it and I knew this is the place for me. So I went in my kind of summer holidays and ordained uh, for three months and then made a commitment to return at the end of my degree. So I ordained in 2006 and uh, after about four years of really intensive practice, Maybe I'm going too far with my story, but I've only taken eight minutes. Okay, so after a lot of intensive practice, my health was suffering a lot. The conditions were incredibly simple. Some would say pretty austere. And uh, the humidity and the heat was really, really difficult, even for the Burmese people, actually. Really intense, and there was no AC. I don't think we even had electricity when I first went to that monastery. No windows on the no glass on the windows of the Dhamma Hall, so the mosquitoes were hanging out with us, you know, as we meditated, free dinner. <laughs> but none of those things mattered so much because I was in the presence of a teacher I had really deep confidence in and the practice was going really well. But it did take a toll on my health. And in 2010, just as I was wondering, you know, what I would do next, because I realized I wouldn't be able to stay there and most of the time, especially for women, if they do come to the point as nuns that they need to move monastery because it's not working in one place, there are very, very few options to go somewhere else. And so a lot of the time, people disrobe. I would say out of all the nuns I know who've disrobed, probably 95% of them, because I probably do know about 20, probably, yeah, 95% of them have disrobed because they just didn't find a place to go. Not because they wanted a relationship or their practice wasn't working, but just because they didn't have the conditions. So this was, you know, a really kind of a critical time in my monastic life. And it so happens that at that same time, I remembered that on a trip to England, somebody had given me these little CDs. Remember CDs, like these round discs? <laughs> <laughs> And I was so, I mean, that was high tech for me because we didn't have electricity, right? And, you know, I certainly didn't have anything like computers or whatever. It was, I think, a three hour kind of slog to get into the city, which we did maybe once every two months to do half an hour of internet. And that was it, you know, till the next two months. Um, so this CD was something I didn't even think to pick up before. But one evening I just thought, okay, I'll just play a talk, even though it's a, a white monk, they're all Western monks. They just talk about harmony and community and, you know, it's like this. Yeah, we know it's like this. You know, what about enlightenment? I don't want to hear about it's like this and, you know, just be equanimous. I want to know about jhanas and enlightenment. So for a long time, I'd ignored those CDs completely. But tonight, anyway, I put it on. And the talk absolutely blew me away. <laughs> I think it was the talk about body contemplation. It wasn't like my favorite talk since, you know, I've listened to thousands, but, um, but it was the best I'd ever heard on that subject. It made total sense. And you can guess who the, who the speaker was. <laughs> Somebody called Ajahn Brahmavamso, who I'd never heard of, but obviously was speaking from quite a deep experience. And I played the next talk the, the following night at sort of 10 o'clock at night after 18 hours of practice. <laughs> but I wanted to stay up an extra hour to listen to another talk. And I think by the second talk, something so deep started to resonate with me that I just sensed I need to practice with this teacher. It was a really visceral sense of being compelled to go and seek him out, wherever he was. I kind of figured, because he mentioned kangaroos and kind of bushfires. <laughs> I couldn't even recognize whether he was English or Australian. It was that long since I'd heard an English accent. I mean, it's a very English accent. He hasn't picked up the Aussie twang. 
Um, but I was trying to figure out, like, you know, where does he even live? And I didn't care. I just thought, wherever he is, I have to find him, you know? And of course, this isn't guru worship. Okay, this is the Dhamma that I could feel was coming from experience. And uh, on a leap of maybe faith or maybe stupidity, <laughs> turned out well in the end, I, um, I left Myanmar after all those years and managed to end up on his retreat in Germany. That was in 2010. By now I'd written him a couple of letters saying, you know, I'm coming to you as your disciple, please kind of take me in, you know, because I want to continue in my monastic life. So when I met him, I was quite nervous because I thought, oh, maybe he knows it's me that wrote those letters, you know, I couldn't figure it out. But uh, when I did finally have a private interview, yeah, he kind of implied that he knew in a very gentle way. And I sensed that, yeah, I was somehow protected by the Dhamma. Things would be okay. It took another two years until I had a chance to get over to Perth. That was in 2012. And I joined the Rains Retreat over here at Bodhinyana Monastery, actually. And, uh, and then I managed to get a place at Dhammasara, Nuns Monastery in Perth, and spent probably three years there. But the whole time, to be quite honest, I was a little bit starved for contact with my teacher. <laughs> and I don't know if it's a comic thing, but I just had this sense that I'm gonna grow through somehow serving alongside him, somehow being of service. And I said to him fairly early on, you know, just, I'm here, I have confidence. Just ask me to do whatever you want. You know, you don't say this lightly to the person, right? But he actually did. <laughs> So in 2015, we came up with this crazy idea, and it was a kind of joke to start a monastery in England because there was nothing there for, for bhikkhunis where women could actually train to take the full ordination. They have Amaravati Monastery and Chithurst Monastery, and good on them that they have an opportunity for women to renounce, right? And it's a, a good ordination platform. They actually take a lot of precepts, about 150, not just the 10 uh, novice precepts, but unfortunately, they, because they don't get the full ordination, they're not actually um, regarded as full members of the Sangha. And the implication of that is that they can't really develop their own communities. They can't actually ordain other nuns. And they're also not seen as fields of merit in and of their own right. So this keeps women still dependent on monks' monasteries, unfortunately. And of course, it's wonderful that they have the conditions to practice. Many women still choose to go to those monasteries and practice. But shouldn't women have the opportunity to follow the complete training that the Buddha laid down, that he advised was like the superhighway to Nibbana? Don't you think they should have that choice? So this is what we began in 2015. I went back to England with nowhere to land, actually. My parents weren't going to put me up for more than a week or two. You know, I'm this strange Buddhist nun, and they've kind of got used to life without me. I left when I was 19 to go to India, and uh, I come back at 35, you know. And from their perspective, I imagine they thought that was quite a reckless thing to do. You know, how was I going to support myself without handling money, without anywhere to stay. I can't drive a car, I can't go shopping. You know, what do you do? So we started from nothing. And uh, I remember Ajahn Brahm saying about how monastics don't have mobile phones. I have to say, it is a privilege not to have a mobile phone. <laughs> because the first thing I had to do to make a start with this project was to get on Facebook. <laughs> and just say, you know, here I am, I'm a, a bhikkhuni, nobody knows me, but anyway, we want to start a monastery. And, uh, and this was how it began, just by gathering a few people that were interested. And over the years, I invited Ajahn Brahm to come and visit in England, and he was always uh, you know, committed to this from the outset, so he would come every year. And uh, it was a lot of work to organize these retreats. But slowly we started to uh, gather some interest. And uh, to this day, I remember when the first 10 pounds came into our bank account, 
And I was like, oh my goodness, somebody knows we exist. This is amazing. You know, somebody's actually thought, I want to give this 10 pounds, which, you know, might have been a lot of money for them to this particular charity for this particular cause. And I was just so touched that, you know, now it was kind of like we're real, we really exist as a charity. So we got registered, I think, as a charity in 2017 or maybe 16 already. And uh, moving on, <laughs> nine years later, last year, we managed to have enough funds through the donations and immense generosity of people throughout the world, you know, international community, to actually get a beautiful property near Oxford. I think you've seen the picture. Oh, there's a picture outside. And, uh, and start the first monastery for women to train as fully ordained nuns in UK. So this is what we've done. <laughs> and this is just, thank you, Sadhu, to everyone. And this is a testament really to the power of faith and spiritual friendship because it's in a way an act of gratitude to my teacher and for everything I've learned from him. So this is a story in brief, much longer than I expected. <laughs> but at least if you've asked me that question, I've already answered it. So. There we go. Okay. Oh, you're giving me a hard one. Dear Ayachanda, please explain the terms used for kamma in the inheritance of deeds, especially the differences. Beings are the owners of their kamma, the heirs of their kamma. They have kamma as their origin, kamma as their property, and kamma as their resort. Hmm. Thanks for clarifying what the Buddha said about kamma, which is confusing to most of us with gratitude and metta. Okay, well, uh, off the top of my head, I'll give uh, some thoughts on this. But most important, I think, to this question is to just clarify the relevance of kamma to our lives and to our practice. Because sometimes these terms are kind of synonymous. There's not really a lot of difference. It's just looking at karma from slightly different angles. And as Ajahn Brahm said, this is kind of relative as well, because this applies basically to the putta jhana. This applies to someone who hasn't yet seen the Dhamma. So in a sense, we're still owning things, right? We're still subject to the effects of the seeds that we've planted, of the karma that we've done. But when we do break through to stream winning, then some of those seeds are basically uh, redundant. They can't give rise to, for example, rebirth in the lower realms. So owning our kama, I think, really means that whatever we do, it's us ourselves. It's this same five kanda process that reaps the results. So it's still experienced within this body and mind. So it's not anybody else's kama, right? If somebody calls you a really bad name, does that really have anything to do with you? Is that your karma or their karma? I'd say it's theirs, right? But it becomes our karma. Our karma becomes our reaction to it. So our karma, if you like, is whatever we do with the experience we have right now. It's being made every moment. Yeah, sometimes people understand karma as some sort of fate, you know, whatever's happening to us now is because of karma from the past. But that's really vipaka, that's not really karma, that's the effects of things done long ago or maybe a short time ago. And that, the Buddha said, is impossible to fathom. We really can't trace it back. We can't be sure that what we experience now is due to this or this or that in the, in the past. And if we take on faith, this idea of rebirth, you know, and billions and trillions of lifetimes, it would be absolutely impossible to know what we've done, right? So that becomes a little bit um, uh, speculative, very speculative. But what we can be aware of is what we're, how we're relating to the experience we're having right now in this present moment. That's the karma that we're making. And the most wholesome karma we can make are those three right intentions, the second factor of the Eightfold Path. Yeah? So to respond with nekama, with letting go 
or if you like, letting be, not owning, not taking responsibility, not controlling what happens. And then kindness, non-ill will, responding with loving kindness and responding with compassion, with gentleness. Part of that gentleness and compassion is patience. Yeah, understanding things are going to change. So we don't need to react. We don't need to get angry in return. Airs of their comma sounds more to me as though the comma's coming a little bit later, <laughs> perhaps. You know, we're going to inherit it in a sense. Yeah, whatever we've done in this life, we will take through with us into a future life. Again, unless we can practice in a way that dissipates those results. And I'll talk a bit more about that tomorrow. They have kama as their origin, so we arise from kama. Kama as their property. Again, it's a little bit like being owners. And kama as their resort. I suppose that means we're kind of living in our own kama, right? Whatever conditions we have around us right now is um, shaping our existence. But I think the most important thing about kama, I mean, rather than getting into these um, different words that the Buddha uses, is, you know, what we're doing with what's arising right now. I really love the way Ajahn Brahm started to talk about kama as meditation kama, the way we relate even to our breath or to the nimittas that can arise in meditation. You know, maybe this has arisen because of lots of good meditation kama, but if we start to control the breath or if we start to react with fear or even with excitement towards the beautiful experience that arises in the mind, then we're going to interrupt the process, right? So what arose through good karma, through skillful ways of attending and relating and observing our mind, actually becomes uh, something that's less skillful because of the way we react. So we always have a chance to change our karma at any moment. That's the beauty of this path, even by just relaxing a little bit or, you know, just having a thought of loving kindness, you're making good karma right there. Okay, I'm not going to, I am going to try and answer all of these, so (laughs) I'll do my best in a short period of time. Okay, how do I teach the Dhamma to my elderly parents who have no previous exposure to Buddhism? especially one who's a very staunch Christian. I don't think they have much time left in this life, unfortunately, with metta. Yeah. So I think Buddhism is quite different from other religions in the sense that we don't really preach or proselytize. Yeah, so even in giving Dhamma talks, There's a a formality that we often do as monastics, which is to actually request the Dhamma talk from the teacher so that the audience actually wants to hear the Dhamma, right? Because unless you want to hear it, somebody can um, speak the Dhamma, but you won't actually take it in. You know, to actually hear it, to really absorb it, requires receptivity. And so if your elderly parents aren't interested and are not asking you, then it might not be so skillful to start talking to them in Buddhist terms. However, I think the most powerful way to influence our parents is just to embody the qualities of the Dhamma as best you can, you know, to show them that you are developing kindness and compassion, you know, to be a harmless person, to be careful about the way you speak, to be incredibly gentle in the way you relate to them to apologize, to ask their forgiveness. You know, if you do react in ways that are less respectful than you wish to, sometimes we can't help it with parents. You know, we get irritated. I'm sure, especially as they get even older, they keep repeating the same things and, (laughs) you know, maybe kind of reacting to you as though you're still a teenager. It's like, oh, don't you see that I've changed? (laughs) Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. So I would say, I mean, for my parents, of course, it was quite a shock that their daughter, who's doing well at school and, you know, they've brought up with traditional, I don't know, 
what sort of values? Good ethical values, but not religious values at all. Like none of us were religious. So I think it was quite a shock for them to suddenly see me in this kind of garb. <laughs> And I could sometimes see my mom hesitate when she'd approach me because in the past it was, oh, you look so lovely, beautiful hair. And then it's like, beautiful, <laughs> bald head. <laughs> so there was a little bit of, ooh, not quite sure what this is. You know, it looks very alien to Western culture. But over the years, they've just seen, I think, me soften. And they've seen me be incredibly committed as well. I think that's one of the things that... Um, starts to inspire faith in our friends and relatives. If they see that we carry on with the practice, no matter how many ups and downs we go through in our lives, then they realize, gosh, there must be something to this if they're willing to carry on, even when it's not pleasant, even when it's not easy. And over time, they see you change. So I think this is really the best way to influence our parents. I'm not sure it's easy to teach them, even when my parents visited our monastery earlier this year, um, I think they were there for one or two dana offerings, and there were quite a few other guests there at the time. And uh, usually I give a little reflection before the meal, but the monk who was visiting, he's actually Adam Ajahn Medito. Some of you might know him from Perth. He's in Newbury at the moment. Uh, I said, could you do it today, please, Ajahn? Because, you know... And he said, oh, yeah, she doesn't want to give a talk in front of her parents. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so he did it. Because, you know, you're their child. They know your weaknesses. They know your kind of faults. And it's very, very hard for them to see you objectively. And also, they don't really want your instruction. They've been teaching you most of their life. And sometimes we forget that. We forget the basic values they brought us up with, which are incredible. I mean, they must be, because everybody who's here has enough good karma, enough conditions in their life, you know, enough health. You've all been fed, <laughs> presumably, <laughs> unless you're a deva. <laughs> so, you know, our parents are our first teachers. So I think the best thing to do is just be kind to them. All right. Would you be able to kindly share a bit of your life story? There we go. I think you've had a bit. All right. <laughs> if you want any more, you can ask me tomorrow, maybe. Okay, wow, this is a letter. <laughs> wow. Ooh, it carries on. All right, here we go. Just wanted to share an, ins an insightful experience. So this is for everybody's benefit. I started meditating this evening by counting my breath, hoping not to stray in my thoughts. As I counted from one onwards, I decided to quickly, within a second or two, to recall my life during that age. Oh, so when I counted to four, I thought very quickly at my time, of my time in kindergarten. When I covered my breath till seven, I thought of my time in primary school. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I continued to count my breath into my teens and into my twenties. Each, as each breath only lasted just a few seconds, it didn't leave me time to ponder, but just to for call. I'm now in my sixties. Uh... As I'm now in my 60s, it took quite a few minutes to reach there. <laughs> Having reached my age number, I continued to count and imagine what my life would be or how it would be like, or how it would turn out, how I would like it to turn out. I had to think quickly because I didn't want to stop breathing. Wow. <laughs> You've got a very fast mind. I counted till a hundred. My insight was that there is not much time in this life. <laughs> so you better count even quicker next time. Time passes quickly, so we ought to get on the insight track as soon as possible. Wow, okay. I don't know if I can keep up with you here. I can't imagine going through my whole life that fast. As you can see, it took me a bit longer than that, just to tell you in brief. But uh, yeah, there is not much time in this life. That's quite true. So if that insight was uh, what came out of it, very good. 
There is a really beautiful quote that says, there's not much time, therefore we must go slowly. So I'm not sure we should speed up. Right? Because real insight comes when the mind is actually able to see things clearly. And that sometimes means we have to slow down. You know, we have to actually calm the mind down so that we can have some moments of silence. Yeah. But yeah, I think death contemplation and realizing that we don't have much time, even there, we still think we have some, right? We might not have any. I mean, all we really know is that we're here right this moment. And I think that can bring a real immediacy to the practice. But remember that immediacy must always be tempered by softness, by kindness, by opening the heart. You know, sometimes people can have that sense of urgency and it gets a little bit tight, a bit desperate almost. And we think that the more we meditate and the more intensively we meditate, the faster we're going to reach the goal. But the more I practice, I actually realize I have to be even more patient. You know, sometimes when we've been practicing a long time, the results seem much slower. In the beginning, sometimes we can have a lot of quite life-changing insights or maybe fairly deep meditation because somehow we're just experimenting. We're not expecting very much, right? We're open to being creative and we're curious and, you know, we really know how to, we're sort of turning up to ourselves for the first time. And over time, those insights are subtler. At least this is in my experience. And because we've already overcome a lot of the coarser kind of defilements, the subtle defilements are very profound, but not as obvious. And sometimes we don't really see the change. So we need to be even more patient and kind and gentle and really trust the process. Because the more we understand non-self, the more we realize that we're not in control, right? We can't speed it up or slow it down. We just have to trust that as long as we're planting seeds, and that means, again, those seeds of good karma, those three right intentions in brief, then we are on the path. And that's all that really matters. You know, time is a construct. It's a fabrication. Time in the human realm compared to the Deva realm is totally different. You know, time in deep meditation seems to disappear. So what is time? It's something we create. And as long as we're actually on the path, that's enough. I think it was Bhikkhu Bodhi who said, um, there's only two things you need to reach the goal. To start walking on the path, that's the Eightfold Noble Path, and to continue. That's it. So most of the time, we're just trying to get on that path. And if you fall off it or you know, you're not on it every moment, don't worry about it. You wouldn't have been anyway, right? <laughs> Until you came in contact with the Buddha's teachings. You weren't on the path, but you were still doing okay. So every time we can align our lives, our actions, our speech, our ways of thinking, ways of looking with the path, it's a step forward. So enjoy it. Don't get in too much of a rush. Thank you for taking our Q&A tonight. <laughs> it's nice to get thanks in advance. Might go wrong now. <laughs> Can you kindly share with us how you've grown over time? Ha! Huh. In regard to the practice of letting go in your life. As a counter to the wanting that arises and becomes established due to whatever is agreeable and pleasurable. Mm, that's a great question. And as I say, you know, sometimes we don't really see how far we're letting go. But um, I think one of the obvious things that comes to mind is taking on the project that I did at Ajahn Brahm's request. Because for me, when I did renounce to live monastic life, I had a particular idea of how that monastic life would be. And it was very much meditation based. So my time before then, doing a lot of practice in meditation centers and even serving on retreats. I was like course manager or kitchen manager. We'd still do five or six hours of meditation a day. And sometimes you'd sit in the hall with the students the whole day. So it's almost 12 hours. You just have a little eye out to make sure everyone's okay. 
Um, so for me, I thought it would be very, very simple, very, very meditative, and a lot of solitude, and I was preparing myself for that. And my life in Burma was that way. It was really simple, not a lot was asked of me, and I was able to meditate to my heart's content. And yet, it became obvious when I had to leave that place that it's not that easy to carry on as a nun. And also that the conditions, the actual structures to live as a nun and be supported in our requisites are not in place. You know, unless you find a particular teacher who's willing to train you as a, as a woman, you're in trouble, you know, it's not, it's not everywhere. And I mean, I could count the Bikuni monasteries, you know, probably on a couple of hands. There aren't many in this world. So um, for me, probably one of the biggest letting goes has been letting go into serving. And I think this is a really huge part of the path. My first teacher actually said there are two qualities that we can assess our progress by. One is the feeling of gratitude and the other one is the feeling to serve others without expecting anything in return. I think that's so beautiful because both of those are sort of signs of letting go, right? Being contented, being grateful for whatever we do have, not wanting more, not wanting to improve or to progress, just recognizing what we have and developing more contentment and gratitude to that. And then this wish to serve, realizing the universality of suffering. It's not just a personal problem. This is a universal problem, right? That needs a universal solution. So when we start to serve in the Dhamma, that's when we really start to develop. And I think for me, in response to the part of the question that talks about doing what's agreeable and pleasurable, it's really, really hard work developing a monastery from the beginning, right? I mean, it's not that I was invited by an established trust. I actually had to find trustees and start a charity, put all the paperwork together, the constitution, get on the internet. All I'd ever done was send emails once every two months. I think I could put an attachment on an email and that was about the extent of my technical ability. Now I had to start a website, write newsletters. It was seriously physically painful, big headaches, you know, tired eyes, and a lot of stress about where I would actually be living from day to day because I didn't have a monastery to stay in. And I had to meet people and just basically ask them, can I come and stay for a few days, you know? So I'd be changing where I was staying every few days and whoever I was staying with was incredibly kind, but of course they have all kinds of questions for you and they want to tell you about their life and all the family problems. So I'd have to be available to them and then go off and, you know, try and search for venues and put the constitution together, et cetera, et cetera. So what I realized at that time was that um, my happiness had to come from something else because it wasn't the happiness born of pleasant feeling, pleasant Vedana. A lot of the time I was really tired and even quite stressed. But there was another kind of happiness, which I think of as, I think in Latin it's called eudaimonic happiness. Yeah, as opposed to hedonic happiness. Hedonic is like the happiness that feels good, like pleasure of the senses. Eudaimonic is the happiness of meaning, the happiness of purpose. And this was very strong because, of course, I asked myself often, do I really want to do this? And I realized that the thought of not doing it, the thought of stopping halfway or failing in some way, would make me really sad because I've been given this opportunity by someone I really respect to really make a difference, not just for myself. I mean, I could have stayed in Perth, but for other women and for future generations. And if I'm not gonna do it, who's gonna do it? I was the only British bikuni. I think there's still only two of us or three of us, maybe a max of four, but not in England. So I realized that this was a kind of responsibility and responsibility is difficult. It's not easy, but I've grown enormously through that. You know, my 20s were just a golden era of practice for me. I had no responsibilities other than those I willingly took on. You know, and even serving on those retreats, I could come and go as I pleased. I never did kind of long-term center management. I was, you know, I could travel to different retreat centers. If it was hot in the south of India, I could go to the Himalaya. 
if it was too cold there, I'd come down to Gujarat or whatever. So it was really a blessed life, and I had so much opportunity to develop myself. So I kind of felt like it was time to give back. And I think, you know, what I've learned about renunciation is that if you really renounce, you even renounce how you think your monastic life's going to look. You literally put yourself in the hands of the Dhamma and respond to what is asked. And I think this is incredibly powerful because it's almost as though we're not, of course, giving our autonomy over to a god or to some human being, but we are, in a sense, giving ourselves over to the triple gem. And if we have a teacher that we really respect and have a lot of uh, confidence in, it's a really safe place to put that confidence. It's an investment, if you like. I remember Ajahn Brahm saying to me in the first or second year, you know, when I was... Uh, still really unsure what would happen. I mean, for me, it was a question of, can I survive as a nun? And for me, that's almost like saying, can I survive at all? Because this is all I ever wanted to do with my life, right? This is the meaning of my life. And I remember at one point he said to me, you've got my comma behind you. And that meant so much. You know, that's powerful comma. So it's not coming through me. And he would say it's not coming through him, right? It's coming through Ajahn Chah, it's coming, I think, back through the bhikkhuni sangha that were around in the Buddha's day. There were many, many enlightened bhikkhunis that were around the Buddha and received direct instruction from him. You know, so that, that is our legacy. Unfortunately, many of the bhikkhuni stories are kind of submerged in the texts, you know, most, because they've been compiled mostly by men. But there were some incredibly powerful, enlightened women in the days of the Buddha, and even now. You know, there are women who practice really, really well, and I really have a lot of respect to all the bhikkhunis who, you know, have tried to establish something for other women because it's not an easy job. So I would say that is one example of the deeper letting go. Yeah. All right, this is part two. Part one, part two. <laughs> Can you kindly share with us how you got your place in Oxford? I think we take that off. Almost. Uh, what? Something. Sutta gave a detailed description of meditation uh, states. Meditation states, please. Okay, detailed description of meditation states. Hmm. So I guess two places come to mind. I mean, that are relevant to our practice here. And uh, one is the Anapanasati Sutta, which is actually descriptive. It's not so much an instruction as a kind of description of what happens naturally when we have the supportive conditions in place. So this is in the uh, Majjhima Nikaya number 118, the Anapanasati Sutta. It's also talked about in the uh, Anapanasamyutta and the Girimananda Sutta as well. Uh, and part of it is in the Satipatthana Sutta. Of course, the Satipatthana Sutta is another place which gives a lot of uh, description of how to use our mindfulness in four different areas that we assume a sense of self to reside. Um, but a lot of the description, if you like, or a lot of the sort of fleshing out of the suttas is done through our teachers and through our practice, through our experience. But yeah, the Anapanasati Sutta talks about, you know, the stages that begin through watching the breath, whether it's long or short, um, and then the whole of the breath, and then the breath starts to become tranquil. As I say, it's not that then we tranquilize the breath. It's more that we're aware that the breath starts to tranquilize, starts to settle down by itself. And from there, PT starts to arise in the mind. Yeah, so this is now starting to observe feeling, starting to observe Vedana, the beautiful pleasure that's not the pleasure born of the senses, but it's the pleasure born from reducing the hindrances through those first four stages. And from the PT, we start to experience a deepening of that, which the Buddha calls sukha. It's more of a contentment, a, a sort of inner happiness. And from there, that also starts to calm down. And then we start to see the mind 
right? This is when the mind starts to reveal itself, often as a light or sometimes as something that we, relates a little bit more to the, or that we would describe more in terms of touch or feeling, but it's still a mental object. This is what the Buddha calls citta sankara. Yeah, and then after that, we start to see that brighten as we stay with it long enough without allowing the hindrances to come in, that can brighten up. And eventually we become free. We, it's called uh, vimochayam chittam, the mind frees itself and enters jhana. Yeah? So this is a kind of very brief description of the Anapanasati Sutta. And then the last four stages are the insights that result from that depth of samadhi. So the insight into letting go, there's already been a lot of letting go, pati nisaga. And I think fading away, uh, what is it then? Viraga, uh, or is it nibida viraga niroda? Is it? Possibly. It's the whole sequence of turning away from the world, turning away from this realm of the five senses. And because we turn away, and we have something else now that we can contemplate, these beautiful pleasures of the mind, then the realm of the five senses starts to fade and eventually cease. So this is actually a description of the whole path. At an even deeper level, this very phenomena of mind and matter ceases completely with full awakening, right? So this is one place that the meditation is described in quite a lot of detail. And the other one that I mentioned is the Upikalesa Sutta, which doesn't necessarily talk about the stages in detail, but it does talk about how to work with the nimittas, or at least what the obstacles are to being able to sustain our attention on the lights that arise in the mind. And that's Majjhima number 139. Two, huh? 128. Ah, yeah, 128. Yeah. 139 is actually um, my favorite sutta. I ran a vibhanga. <laughs> That's why it came to mind. Yeah, thank you. One, two, eight. So in there, it talks about the kind of um, uh, more refined hindrances that can occur at that stage in meditation. So we've already abandoned most of the five hindrances, but then we have what are called the upakilesas, which are kind of the more refined ones like excitement or fear or the energy dipping a little bit or becoming a little bit too much. So it's a matter of balancing our energies at that point and just being able to stay present, stay still, not get too um, uh, kind of swayed by these things. You know, again, it's about noticing how we're relating to what's arising and, and keeping that perspective of, I like this talk by Ajahn Brahm years and years ago of the knower and the known. And he used this paradigm of the being something that's known sort of out there on a screen, if you like. Of course, there's no real screen. And the knowing. I prefer the knowing than the knower because it's actually a process. It's not a, a being in any way. It's nothing permanent. It's not an essence of who I am. So we have this knowing and we have what's known. And between there, we need to keep that very pure, filling it up with loving kindness, compassion, gentleness, patience doing nothing, right? Letting go. It really means stopping, just staying quiet. So this is a really important meditation instruction, especially at that stage. In the beginning, okay, I think it's valid to say that we can direct the mind gently to the breath. You know, ideally we have the foundations in place and I'm gonna talk about that tomorrow, the virtue, some sense restraint, and this, you know, makes it easy to hold the breath in mind without too much struggle. But we do have to direct the mind to something in the beginning, at least for most of us, unless, you know, like Ajahn Brahm, we've practiced so long that the mind has nothing else to do. <laughs> okay. Did I answer the first part of that? Can you share how you got your place in Oxford? Can I see if we can get to that tomorrow and if, uh, or at the end of tonight? And if not, I'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow, hopefully. Yeah? Cool. Upon being a bikuni, is it easy to pass? <laughs> pass what? <laughs> I think you mean, I think you mean, is it easy to take bikuni ordination? Could it mean that? Yeah, 
Right, okay. Yeah, all right. And part two, based on your personal experience, what is the most challenging aspect of being a bikini? Thank you. All right. So the process towards bikini ordination, and you'll notice, hopefully, I never say being a bikini because it's not becoming anything you're renouncing, okay? And I think this is, it looks maybe niggling. It looks like a, maybe a really subtle point, but it's an important point because this really is a path of renunciation. And I think, you know, quite often we come to the spiritual path to improve what we think of as a deficient self or a deficient sense of self that's somehow lacking in some way. And if only we could improve ourselves, we could become kinder, we could be more spiritual, then we'd be happier. Do you relate to that? I mean, there's some validity to that. Of course, we want to be kinder, right? But it's still coming from a sense of self. And quite often, it's actually based on some aversion towards ourselves. So it's important not to think of, you know, monastic life as some kind of solution to all our difficulties, because it isn't. You're going to carry with you the same inner patterns, the same complexes, the same suffering and patterns that you always had. And simply putting on the robes doesn't change you as a person. It's a training. So because it's a training, I think even before we get to that point of being ready to renounce, the renunciation has to start happening in smaller ways. You know, in our lifestyles, we renounce bad conduct, harmful conduct. We renounce unskillful speech to some degree. We start to live lives that are more ethical, more beautiful, more harmless to other beings and to ourselves. And perhaps we start to meditate and come to retreats like this. And maybe, who knows, some of you might come again even to serve the retreat. I think that's also really important to start expanding your concern for the well-being of all beings, from yourself to others, you know, and serve in whatever way you can. And then perhaps coming to monasteries and spending some time there, because every monastery is completely different and it will depend, you know, on the environment, on the people there, as to whether you feel this is a place that I can really grow. So the whole aim of the spiritual path in one sense, of course, is to disappear completely, but before we get to that, we want to try and increase the wholesome qualities and decrease the unwholesome qualities in our mind. And the Buddha said to use that yardstick to determine whether a place is conducive for the practice. Are the wholesome qualities increasing? Of course, not just in a couple of days. You've got to give it time. But on the whole, over a period of time, are the wholesome qualities increasing and the unwholesome ones decreasing? In other words, are you experiencing more happiness? Because if we go for, you know, monastic life before we're ready, it's going to be really tough and you might not be happy at all. And it can happen that people get put off the practice if they go too far too soon. So it's a process. And I think, you know, there's no test. If that's what you're asking, there's no test as such. But it's more about the community and especially the teacher who you're going to train with feeling confident that you're ready, and you feeling confident with that teacher who you're going to train with. So it's a mutual decision in, in a sense. It's a community decision in a big monastery, especially. And uh, I think the only um, real criteria when it comes to the ordination itself are that you're in pretty good health, reasonable health. Um, you don't have a terminal disease, even if you do, and the monastery is well supported, some kinds of things, you know, we call them terminal, they can last, they can still live 10, 20 years. Um, and that, I mean, this is a difficult thing to say, and this is something that the Sangha is working on. But so far, there's a question around gender. So to be a bhikkhuni, you're asked, are you a real female? <laughs> and to be a bhikkhu, you're asked the question, are you a real male? So there's some discussion around this now, because what about transgender folks? Like, how do we define gender? Is it just physiological or is gender something much bigger than that? And I think this is a really exciting conversation to be having. Certainly in the Bikuni Sangha, it's happening. And I think in monasteries like this. And that's really, really wonderful. The same around gender non-binary folks. 
okay, so you're physiologically female, but you don't identify as a woman. You identify as this third gender, gender non-binary, you know. So where do you belong? Do you belong with the bikunis? Do you belong with the bhikkhus? And recently, Ajahn Brown was discussing this with one of the uh, retreatants, and he said, you know, wherever you feel you belong, which is beautiful in principle, and that's the ideal that I think anyone with a compassionate heart would aspire to. Of course, again, so long as the community agrees, and this is where it's difficult, because not everyone in the community will feel the same. So this is, yes, it's more difficult, but then if we want to live in democracy, democracy is not easy to come by. Democracy has to be um, cultivated. We have to grow into democratic people <laughs> who are willing to let go sometimes of what we think is right and go with the majority vote. So that's another kind of renunciation. So yeah, that is, um, to be honest, it's not that easy to, to find the opportunity to ordain as a bhikkhuni simply because there are so few places. So, but if you really have that conviction and that feels like your path, just take the first step. For me, I mean, there was no other choice. And I was, you know, basically, I remember in my early retreats, knowing that I was taking a massive risk by not studying, not going back to England, you know, not having anything like some kind of retirement plan. I mean, I wasn't earning anything. I was just living kind of very, on a very, very small budget and working around Asia for a few months here, a few months there, trying to get a visa to go back to India and just develop my practice. And the thought that gave me confidence was, I guess, faith in the practice itself. A little bit idealistic. I thought, well, by the time it comes to ordain and if, you know, it doesn't work out, I won't have any fear anyway because the practice will have helped me abandon fear. <laughs> That's how much faith I had. And I think later I modified that. Well, okay, maybe I won't be free from fear, but I'll know how to work with it. I'll know how to work with it. You know, and, and I had enough confidence to know that I would always find some way to practice. It wouldn't depend entirely on whether I was a nun or not, right? There'd always be a way. The Buddha said, if you protect the Dhamma, the Dhamma protects you. And this is a beautiful thing to keep in mind. So yeah, just briefly, and it's already nine o'clock, I've not done that much better than Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> so much for my conceit. But I will try, if you're up for staying a bit longer, I'll try and do a few more. Um, the most challenging aspect has been not having somewhere to practice and actually having to develop my own monastery in a non-Buddhist country without any support. That's been probably the most challenging. And also, to be honest, I have to say, and I've reconciled to this now, but because of that strong connection I had always with Ajahn Brahm, which is why I left Burma, not being able to actually live and train directly under him has been very painful. Because in Myanmar, I actually did have a teacher that took me in. And he was of a similar caliber to an Ajahn Brahm. So he had also noble qualities that gave me immense confidence. And it was heartbreaking, you know, to have to leave because of my health. Um, so in a sense, you know, when Ajahn Brahm's teachings came into my life, it was like, it was a holy lifesaver, let's say. <laughs> it was a second chance to continue living my holy life. And uh, I knew the importance of being around a good teacher through my time in Burma. So, so that's been hard. But now, because of this project, although, you know, I'm on the opposite side of the world, I have a lot of guidance, a lot of contact, and, you know, we actually work on this together very closely. So that is a privilege and a blessing because, of course, you pick up so much. Uh, not just, you know, the emotional and spiritual support, but just the very practical things like, you know, how to address something that comes up at a trust meeting or how to handle difficult people, you know, how and when to act in an abusive situation? When is it too much? You know, so many things. So this is really great. And I think, again, we might not always have that much contact with someone we have confidence in as a noble person. I say we have confidence in because no one's gonna make that claim. Uh, and I wouldn't claim it on behalf of another person. But we can learn a lot from one another too. And I think this is why retreats like this are so powerful, right? It's different from meditating on your own.
you have the energy of everybody else who's trying to practice. Even their presence sometimes is enough to give you that kind of courage to just continue, to just get into the hall. You know there's other people there, you're not alone. Yeah. So yeah, isolation also. COVID was hard. <laughs> but anyway, hopefully that, I, I did want to talk about that a bit. Let's see. Can you share with us the process of one of your deep meditations? <sighs> not really, that's the problem, because as monastics, we're not allowed to talk about deep meditation. So the fact that you use the word deep meditation, that normally is Ajahn Brahm's kind of, um, what do you call it, like uh, code for jhana meditation. So I can't use it in that sense but I can use it in the sense of a process, perhaps, and talk about part of the journey. So without saying how far it went. <laughs> but one, one experience that really stood out to me was a, an experience that started off very simply by just feeling quite content, quite peaceful in my cootie a long time ago when I had a cootie. I haven't had a cootie for nine years now. But at that time, in Dharmasara, in the forest, I had a simple life. And I was sitting in my cootie during the rains retreat, and I noticed while I was uh, watching my breath that, yeah, it's quite peaceful. I just had that reflection. You know, I realized there wasn't a lot of thinking going on. The breath was there. And also, I noticed it was quite unremarkable. It was, you know, a nice meditation. There was no judgment there. But uh... And then I had this two words just popped into my head, which were from the previous week's Dhamma talk with Ajahn Brahm, and it was something like notice bliss. Just those two words, because I hadn't really noticed it. I just noticed it was peaceful, but nothing particularly you know, special. And these two words, notice bliss, came in my mind, and it was as though the mind kind of tuned in to this different frequency. It was like a wavelength that was there all the time, but I hadn't really noticed. I was with the slightly coarser radio waves. I don't know if you really have coarse and refined radio waves, but anyway, I was with the peace, but I hadn't noticed that there was actually some bliss there. And it was much more refined than I expected it to be. One of the difficulties with this idea of PT, of rapture or bliss that can arise in the mind is that we tend to interpret it through what we normally think of as bliss, the kind of bliss that we experience in the five senses, which is something much coarser. You know, the bliss of eating a delicious meal or obviously any kind of sexuality is pretty coarse, right? It might be intense, but it's very coarse. Or even the joy of nature compared to deep meditation is quite coarse. So sometimes we're simply not noticing it because we're not quite clear on what we need to look for. And at this particular moment, as soon as I noticed there was some bliss, it just really, I don't know how to explain it other than that it just kind of immersed the mind and body. It just blew up suddenly and became so intense, but really pure, really, really pure and powerful and intense at the same time. So it had these two qualities, again, that you don't generally find with the five sense pleasure. It was blissful and intense, but it was peaceful too. And this is different. The happiness of the senses is very rarely peaceful. Right? Because there's always some clinging involved. Even if it's the subtle fear of it you know, disappearing or a subtle kind of wanting it to last. You know, you've had a cup of tea with your friends, but you kind of, you know that you're okay, really, and the conversation could stop, but you think, well, let's just have another one because we might get a bit more out of this. You know, we might be able to squeeze a bit more pleasure. But the longer you go, the less the reward. It's that law of diminishing returns. You start to get a bit, you know, jittery because you've had too much caffeine and the conversation's just kind of trailing all over the place. And, you know, but you still want it to carry on because you're not actually satisfied. But this happiness, this bliss, was totally satisfying to the point where I could really, I mean, I guess, 
at that point in my practice, it was notable and I felt that I could really let go into it in a deeper way than I'd been able to before. And the other interesting thing was that whenever some little, what I call sticky fingers would come in, and it was often subverbal, just to kind of mm, want to just have a look. <laughs> whenever that would happen, this sort of mental movement of just going out slightly to the bliss, it would recede. And if I could just, as it were, sit back again and let go, it would again increase in intensity. So that was very interesting because I could see that process of subtle craving and holding um, that wasn't always you know, that, that obvious. These are really refined hindrances that you know, prevent that next step. So it's, nine, it's seven minutes past nine. How is everybody doing? Good. Doing good? Yeah? All right. I still have to give a talk tomorrow, so if it isn't very articulate, please forgive me. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> okay. Is physician-assisted suicide for the terminally ill requesting it bad karma for the patient or doctor? What is the consequence for the patient's next life? Okay, so we don't know the consequence for the patient's next life, simply because, like that story Adrian Bram told, this is one of the decisions that person made in their life, and their life was so much more than that. So one of the biggest uh, myths, I suppose, or misunderstandings in Theravada Buddhism, unfortunately inherited from the Abhidhamma, from probably, I don't know if it's in the Visuddhimagga, but it's from the Abhidhamma, is this idea of the last mind moment being the determining factor, the sole determining factor, even the last thought of your next life. Which would be so awful, wouldn't it? It'd be really like Ajahn Brahm's exams. You know, everything hangs on the exam and whatever you've done beforehand doesn't count for anything. This would be really a scary moment and I think most people would probably fail it because they'd be so afraid. <laughs> so the consequence for the person's next life is the sum total of all the good and bad karma they've done in their previous lives and it just depends what's coming up at that moment so if the person requesting for that assisted suicide is doing so out of compassion for themselves maybe out of compassion for someone who's caring for them um, maybe i don't know what the other reasons could be i mean of course it could be despair but quite often if it's voluntary euthanasia, oh, this is physician assisted, okay. If it's voluntary, it's entirely on that patient, I would say, because it's their own decision, okay. And that means they take on the karma of that. And they're also checked really, really carefully by teams of doctors and psychologists to make sure they're in a good state of mind. If it's physician assisted, I don't know, is there a difference here? I'm not quite sure. Because of course, even involuntary, I think the physician still has to give the drug or the injection or whatever it is. So it's really hard to say. And again, I would say it comes down to their, com their intention. I don't think it's black and white. And unfortunately, I mean, we all want black and white answers. We want to make sure we're doing the right thing. But most of karma is a shade of gray. You know, even when we're kind, there can be shades of grey to that too. We might be being kind because, please, if anyone wants to leave, it's okay. I just noticed some people were going to bed, so please, if anybody else wants to, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, even being kind or being compassionate, I mean, if we're not enlightened, if we don't have a similar level of wisdom to our compassion, then who knows, maybe it wasn't compassion with wisdom but at least we tried our best. So most of the time it's gray. Yeah. Right, yeah, some countries don't allow and some people have to travel to different countries to have it done. So I guess there's a different understanding there of what's ethical and less ethical. But countries like Switzerland are doing it now. Somebody from the BSWA actually went there to have a, a voluntary euthanasia, I think last year. I don't think it's available because she was Australian. She went to Switzerland. I wonder why she went there then. Yeah. Different criteria, yeah. It might, it might be that she wouldn't qualify here for that. Yep, yep. 
And I did read, actually, that in Switzerland they're kind of reviewing it and there might be some changes to the criteria that some people are not very happy about, including the doctors, because it will make it probably really hard for people to, uh, to get the help they need. Because when they're that ill, it's so hard for them to travel already and they have to make a few trips. Whereas in the past, I think they only had to make maybe one trip and they could do the rest by Skype or something like that. So, but I mean, basically, it's a big conversation worldwide. And it's not something that I think anyone is taking lightly. I mean, doctors and um, physicians are very ethical people on the whole, you know, they're hopefully they're in that job because they want to help pe beings and they want to try and alleviate suffering. So I think a lot of it, you know, we have to make these decisions for ourselves. Even with the bhikkhu and bhikkhuni vinaya, sometimes when people first ordain, they tend to be very um, literal in their interpretation of the rules. It's like yes or no, do or don't. And later on, we realize these have to be applied to a context. You know, and we have to use our wisdom and compassion as best we can when interpreting these rules. So it's very nuanced. But sometimes we just know, don't we, what's right in ourselves, Or at least we know the best possible decision given the circumstances. And because it's given the circumstances, given our conditioning, given our capacity to really know what's right, given the options available to us, we can have a bit of forgiveness. Also for other people if we think they've made a mistake. Maybe it was the best they could do, you know, with their body and mind and conditions at that time. Please, could you discuss the third precept, sexual misconduct, in a little... Oh, please, could you discuss? It is a little more vague than the other precepts at times in terms of harm and wrong. Obvious abuse, non-consensual acts, exploitation is clearly harmful, but other aspects not as clear. Please discuss. Thank you. Yeah, it isn't as clear, I think, again, because it can be cultural. So, for example, where I learned meditation in India, they had a very literal translation of sexual misconduct as any sexual activity outside of marriage. Not even a committed partnership was included. And uh, for most people who were not Indian, that was actually quite difficult to, um, to reconcile. But most people did, and I mean, many, I suppose most of the assistant teachers in that tradition, it was Goenka, the Goenka tradition, um, they do end up getting married in order to be appointed as teachers. Like, that's one of the criteria to be a teacher. You have to be in a committed relationship, which means marriage. So it, they actually do make that commitment. But I think recently it's, it's relaxed a bit to include, like, long-term committed relationships. Another really good thing I actually liked in that tradition, this was, I think, a bit rigid, but one thing I liked was that um, in order to qualify for a long retreat, which meant 30 days of complete silence, 12 hours a day practice, all on your own, <laughs> just listening to a talk every day, you had to be either in such a committed relationship or celibate for a year. And I actually thought that was great because I think... Although it might not seem like sexual misconduct when we kind of meet someone we like and then things happen and we enjoy ourselves for a bit, it's not necessarily very responsible or very careful or circumspect either. And we can make a lot of mistakes, you know, that hurt ourselves and hurt the other person. And I do think, you know, to be ready to really explore the mind, we need to start turning away or perhaps it's better to say it becomes natural to start turning away from the world of sensuality. For me, from my first course, I think I was celibate for quite a few years. And then I met another meditator and I already wanted to ordain, but unfortunately, yeah, we became very close and got into a relationship and it was really a problem for me. Like, it was actually kind of, oh no, I don't want this. <laughs> I actually don't want this to happen because I want to be a nun, you know? And I knew that if I'm in that relationship, it has to be committed. So, you know, we had to commit. Fortunately, we didn't get married, <laughs> which I'm very, very grateful for. Because eventually I realized it just wasn't going to work. You know, the, the, the desire, desire, 
the, um, how to say it, it's like, it's not even a conviction at this point, it's like a process of renunciation that had been set in motion that couldn't be turned back. That could not be turned back. And then I just couldn't remain in that relationship. I mean, luckily it was mutual because that person also wanted to ordain, which they never did. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but I was clear. So um, I don't know. I think one of the signs of maturity in practice is that we do start to choose our partners less through sort of the superficial things like attraction or even just to fulfill or to, yeah, a temporary relief from loneliness. And we start to actually uh, choose relationships that are more Dhamma-based. You know, we choose partners who can actually help us grow in spiritual qualities, can help us grow on the path. So I think this starts to happen naturally as we practice. And I think that's ideal especially if you can find a partner. I was speaking to two ladies earlier today and they were saying about an ex-monk who got married, but they got married to a Dhamma partner and they have a wonderful relationship and do so much service and, you know, uh, serve on retreats and, and it's a really wholesome uh, relationship. So this is ideal. So I don't know really. I mean, that was my uh, sort of understanding or my own personal ideas around it but you again you have to find out for yourself mm. ideally we want to be moving away from indulging in the senses just for the sake of indulgence temporary relief from suffering oh dear all right well i have five more i can try all right Thank you for taking over and being with us the past week. Your meta truly lights up Jana Grove and greatly enhances our experience. That's very sweet. Do you think there should be more emphasis on meta <laughs> as the path of practice? I can't believe you've asked this because I was so tempted to give a talk on meta tomorrow, but then I decided not to because I love meta and I think it should be the path of practice. But I decided I'll weave it in instead. <laughs> The Metta Sutta implies that the ultimate uh, something is the non-returner. The ultimate fruit is the non-returner. Not necessarily. The Sutta on Gatikara seems to corroborate this as well. I'm not sure about that part, but the thing is, I think Metta can take you all the way to full enlightenment. Because to practice any of these things to their depth, the other factors of the path have to be present. So, I mean, just as Anapana can take you into jhana, and from jhana we have the opportunity to see things as they are, we can also practice metta and compassion and mudita and equanimity to the level of deep meditation, jhana practice. And from there again, we have the opportunity to see things as they are. But as someone asked yesterday, you know, why don't other people from other traditions who get into jhana experience nibbana? You know, why don't they see non-self? And the missing piece there is right view. If you haven't been exposed to right view to the teachings of the Buddha, then you may get stuck in those places and you may interpret them as union with God or you know, cosmic consciousness, unconditional love, because that's how it feels. You know, imagine a metta jhana. You're just completely blissed out on loving kindness, perhaps for hours and hours and hours. For perhaps if that's your main practice, you abide in that state for days, maybe not in the jhana, but certainly with enough metta to keep those hindrances of ill will completely away you would probably feel that you were, you know, equivalent to a god, <laughs> that you'd abandoned all hindrances. I'm sure a lot of, you know, the great forest masters or mistresses, if there are any, forest monks and nuns who practice deep meditation, they might not see hindrances for years. I'm sure there must be a lot of people who might feel that they're fully enlightened or non-returners, but we don't really know for sure. 
So the sign of someone who's really taken it to the depth of full liberation is that they understand non-self. And they understand the workings of paticca samapada, of dependent origination. And in my experience, at least, anyone who I've met who I do have confidence in as an Arya, as a noble being, they talk about Paticca Samapada as a really keen insight that's transformed their lives. You know, this is, this is the peace we understand, suffering, the arising of suffering and the passing away. We understand that this thing that we, you know, regard as a self through delusion is actually just a process. It's just a dependently arisen process. So, uh, yes, I do think metta can be a path of practice. Whether it's the path of practice for, for you is something you have to know. But I do wish more people would take it on as their main meditation practice because I think for most of us, or at least speaking for myself, the main hindrances are probably aversion, you know, being that little bit too fault-finding. Someone said that they feel a lot of metta coming from me, which is wonderful, and I do practice a lot of metta meditation. But still, you know, aversion can manifest not as anger so much, in my case, very often. In fact, I don't think I ever shout at anyone. Maybe, maybe I get a bit irritated with my parents. I have to confess now. <laughs> but in meditation, aversion is much more subtle than that. You know, it, it's much more subtle. Sometimes it's just not allowing ourselves to really get still, to really sink in and soak up that bliss. That's how I experience it anyway. So I think it would be well for many of us to practice more metta, more loving kindness, because it's also such a harmonizer, such a healer for the world. One of the uh, definitions of loving kindness is sima sambeda, and it means breaking boundaries. That means breaking the boundaries that we erect in our own hearts, but also between ourselves and others. You know, I like you, but not you. I'll be kind to you if you're kind to me. Or I'll like you if you like me. <laughs> Or if you are like me, if you look like me, if you sound like me, speak like me, you know, have the same religion as me. So metta breaks all those boundaries and just becomes a beautiful quality that's so expansive and includes all beings, human, non-human, visible, invisible, all beings, even in the other realms, places we maybe can't go to ourselves, but we can imagine there are beings that are suffering deeply because we can experience that in ourselves. So loving kindness is very powerful, and I think of it as a wisdom practice, because it's really the realm of perception, understanding how perception creates our reality. When we look at the world through the eyes of metta, it's a different world than the world seen through the eyes of ill will. Hmm? Which one's real? Maybe neither are real, but we can certainly say which one is preferable, which one is more conducive to our own happiness and the happiness of all. So I've got four more questions. I'm very worried about the physical pain, loss of dignity, loss of freedom, and being a burden to others, arising from being seriously sick and aging. May I have your advice on how to mitigate the fear? Thank you very much. Loving-kindness meditation, again, is actually taught by the Buddha the first time he teaches it in the suttas is an antidote to fear, not to ill will, but to fear, because fear also is an aversive state. And that's the story of the monks who went out to the forest against the Buddha's wishes to meditate in a lonely place overnight. And they started hearing strange noises and really spooky kind of seeing spooky sights. And they got really scared out of their wits to the point that they ran back to the Buddha. Ah, we shouldn't have gone there. <laughs> you were right. And the Buddha said, OK, practice loving kindness and then go back. Practice loving kindness to those beings. And it's not just that they were scared of those beings. You know, this was one of the problems. But it's also that they didn't have enough loving kindness. 
And when we don't have enough loving kindness, other beings pick up on that and they get aggressive towards us. They feel afraid of us. If we're scared, have you noticed, when we're scared or we approach somebody with a kind of suspicious attitude, they also get pretty defensive. They can feel that energy. So these poor spirits probably needed a lot of metta, but instead they got these monks fear. So when they went back, the spirits were happy, they received the metta and they stayed quiet. And in the same way, if you practice metta in daily life, you know, especially when this fear comes up, but even beforehand, it's easier before, then you'll start to change that habit. And one of the beautiful things that I've uh, noticed when I've been, I've had the privilege to be around two or three people who've been dying, one of them is happening right now. She is, we don't know how long she's got. It could be weeks, it could be a couple of months, probably not more. But it could be any day and she's aware of that. And it's really remarkable and a huge privilege to be around people like this, simply because their values start to shine. You know, whatever they were holding on to in the world is not a refuge anymore. Their husband, their work, no matter how wholesome, no matter how much they helped others, they have to leave it behind. You know, this person has to um, except that whatever she's done to train on her kind of uh, trainees, I won't say which field she works in, because it's uh, just to keep her confidentiality, she's done her best and she has to hope that they'll take over and continue to, uh, to carry it forward, to carry everything she's tried to give to them forward and help other beings. And she told me recently when I went to visit her that... Uh, it's remarkable because she's not even trying to feel gratitude for the people looking after her. It's just spontaneous. And I said, well, that's your practice. That's your lifetime of practice. Even though she didn't think her meditation is very good, very deep, but still she's been practicing for many decades. And her eyes are shining with loving kindness. It's just so beautiful to see. So when I meet people like that, it takes away my fear. <laughs> And at one point, she kind of said to me half jokingly, it'll be disappointing, won't it now, if I don't die? Because <laughs> she's quite looking forward to it after all this. So renouncing is a beautiful thing if you have something more beautiful to take refuge in. And I think that's one of the reasons as well that metta is so powerful, because sometimes it's hard to let go if we don't know what we're letting go into, so to speak. And for Christians, they have this idea of God. They can let go, surrender to a God. We don't really have that, but we can still surrender, let go into loving kindness. Not just as an idea, but as a visceral quality, a feeling, a softness, an expansiveness that we develop in our heart. So this, this is going to help you. And, you know, it's good in a sense that you're worried about this, because at least you're thinking about it. The reality is, of course, we just don't know how it's going to go. But we do know that if we can make peace, be kind, be gentle, now, even when fear arises, open your heart to that fear, then when it does come your turn to start letting go of this particular body, you'll have something beautiful to let go into. All right. My friend and his family are able to see spirits, and sometimes the spirits would follow my friend home. This, my friend, uh, felt very disturbing. <laughs> this, my friend felt, was very disturbing. What can my friend do to avoid these spirits? So again, send them loving kindness. I'm going quicker now because uh, I know most of you are tired, including myself. Send them loving kindness. Don't try to avoid them. It might be that these spirits actually are desperate for that love. My own teacher in Burma used to say that was why they created disturbance sometimes for the meditators, because they knew that we had loving kindness, but they wanted some of it. So share it. And even if the spirits stay, your friend will be less afraid. But it's likely they'll disappear if you send them some loving kindness. And send yourself a lot of loving kindness too. Nibbana is said to be the highest happiness, but in Nibbana, the six sense bases, including the mind, has already gone. How is this happiness to be felt? Or is this happiness indescribable to an unenlightened being? Thank you. 
Yes, it's undescribable. <laughs> but what it does say in the suttas, and I think it was Sariputta that said this, he said that, or maybe it was the Buddha speaking to Sariputta. He was talking about all the different kinds of Vedana and the different kinds of, uh, yeah, the different kinds of um, experience or pleasant feeling, let's say, that can arise. So they can arise through the senses, they can be um, wholesome or unwholesome, so spiritual or worldly. You know, you can have very refined happiness in different realms. But then he said that Nibbana is the highest happiness. And uh, this precise question was asked, you know, how is that possible? How can you describe that as happiness if it doesn't come from Vedana? It doesn't come from the Kandas or the six senses. And the Buddha said, wherever and however happiness is felt, I include it in happiness, in feeling. I think he said in happiness. I'm not quite sure now. But however it's to be experienced, he describes it. So even if it's nothing to do with the senses, it's still happiness. That's as far as he could go, so I can't really go much further than that. But I think the main thing is just to have the confidence that along this path, every time you let go of something, you experience more happiness. Every time you cultivate wholesome qualities, you know, you, you experience the rewards, the benefits of that. So that's going to continue. It's just going to get better and better. And these kind of doubts and fears are going to disappear. The process will take over. And, you know, if you want to, you can slow it down. It's okay. I mean, we're doing that all the time, aren't we? We're putting the brakes on on ourselves in our practice all the time. If we feel a little bit, oh, it's too much for me. And that's okay, you know. We just need to be conditioned again and again and again by our teachers, by reading the Dhamma, by experiencing these things and allowing ourselves to to trust in the happiness that has nothing to do with the sensual realm. Last question. <laughs> in the past few nights, I've experienced extremely, emo oh, sorry, e increasingly emotionally charged dreams at night. Interestingly, they, co sorry, I'm getting tired now. Interestingly, they coincide with increasingly blissful meditations in the day. Number one. This is the very common question in meditation. Is this normal? The answer is always yes. Whatever happens to you is normal because our minds are just the same as everyone else's minds. You know, they have the same kind of realm of experiences or range of emotions. So nothing that happens is abnormal as such. It will be different from person to person, depending on our karma or upbringing, our particular state of mind at the time, but it's normal. And why does it happen? Yeah, it's an interesting question, and I think one reason, it happens to me too, by the way, so I don't know, am I normal? I don't know, maybe I'm not normal. <laughs> but I think one reason is that as we deepen our meditation, the bliss arises, that's a sign that the meditation is going deeper we're kind of uncovering deeper layers, if you like, of the mind. I mean, it's not like there's really a layer there, but this is just a kind of metaphor. It's as though we're going into parts of the mind that have remained fairly unconscious to us so far. We're not aware of them. You know, like in the example I gave, the bliss was there, but I just hadn't seen it. I hadn't been aware or open to it. So all of this is there and, you know, because our mindfulness is not very strong, we don't experience that bliss. So I think that in, in the evenings, in the nights, we also kind of tap into that subconscious mind. And because the mindfulness is stronger, we become more aware of what's actually happening in our minds. So whether those dreams are really more intense and emotionally charged than usual, I'm not sure. Maybe we're just more aware of them. Or maybe it's stuff that needs to be processed. You know, sometimes it's symbolic. Sometimes it's things that we've been repressing inside, worries that we've had, things that have happened that we felt strange about, and it comes up in images or, you know, in sort of scenarios or whatever. And you can relate it quite easily to something in your life. So I think sometimes it's just the mind's way of trying to make sense and process some of that I don't know, emotional kind of material, perhaps, that's somehow trapped in the deeper layers of the mind. 
sometimes it's sort of in the body too. Somebody asked the question about trauma that's in the body and how to process that. And I think often, you know, if it's experienced in the body initially, it needs to be processed by re-experiencing the body, but in a different way with a lot more kindness and compassion. So actually going into those sensations, those feelings in the body and starting to allow them to loosen up. Just to finish off, because somebody who was, a, I think, a counselor asked the question related to that about how to manage with the kind of um, the emotional uh, content of the client, you know, that the clients bring and how to actually process it at the end of the day. Because, you know, if you're not Ajahn Brahm and you don't have a hole in the bottom or in the middle as a donut, then, you know, you can't just let it go. Right? And I think one really effective way of doing that is actually to do some body scanning. It's something that my own teacher used to call sweeping. It's not even just the scanning. It depends on your mind. But if your mind's quite um, aware, you don't have to go part by part really slowly. You can just actually sweep the body. So you're just moving the attention from top to the toes fairly quickly again and again. And this is very relaxing for the body. And also giving yourself that loving kindness. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if there's a lot of kind of difficult sensations or anxiety, it's helpful to just widen the breadth of your awareness to include the whole body. Don't go straight into the difficult bits. Open up the awareness and include some of the peripheral parts, even the skin or the palms of the hands, and just stay with whatever's easy to stay with. So this is one way that we can start to process all our emotions, right? Whether we think we've picked them up from someone else, because really it's not their emotions we're feeling. What we're really feeling is our response to their emotions. So even while you're in that <coughs> setting, you know, if you are a counselor, just remaining mindful of what's going on for you is a protection for you. And having that beautiful attitude. Okay, we did it. <laughs> sadhu, sadhu. So thank you very much for your wonderful probing questions and your sincere and deep practice and beautiful presence on this retreat. And hopefully tomorrow morning we can have some more Dhamma and some metta meditation to end the retreat. Okay, sleep well. <laughs>